section one of the history teachers magazine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the history teachers magazine volume one number two october nineteen o nine section one gain loss and problem in recent history teaching by professor william macdonald of brown university the newer methods of history teaching which were authoritatively set forth for the first time in this country in the report of the committee of seven of the american historical association and which during the past ten years have increasingly made their way in the better secondary schools have had for their aim the emancipation of history from the bondage of mere mechanical routine the clearer discrimination of essentials and non-essentials the use of comparison and judgment as well as of memory in the mastery of historical knowledge the systematic exploration of books other than the textbook and the intelligent correlation of the subject with literature art economics geography and other kindred fields that there should have been criticism not seldom unfriendly of the new methods and their results is only natural the new procedure had to be learned by teachers as well as by pupils and its application to the conditions of particular schools determined by careful study of local possibilities and needs what was possible in a large and generously supported school was not equally attainable in a small and poor one and it was inevitable that mistakes should be made even by those most interested in making the new work a success no more in history than in language or mathematics both of which have undergone pedagogical reformation in our day was perfection to be won at the outset all things considered however it seems to me indisputable that wherever there has been an honest and earnest attempt to make the new method successful a gratifying and very considerable measure of success has been attained broadly speaking the formal recitation based mainly upon the study of a textbook has been given up the history of england is no longer generally studied by the reigns of sovereigns nor the history of the united states by presidential administrations there is wide use of source books and documents and much intelligent reading in narrative histories biographies journals letters travels and other literature map drawing is extensively required and illustrated lectures or talks and historical excursions have been made to contribute their wealth of information and interest from every point of view the position of history in the school curriculum is more dignified and rational than it used to be its pedagogical method more intelligent its fruition in knowledge and power more valuable no method of teaching however is ever so bad that its abandonment is not attended with some loss to the pupil in spite of all the success which has undeniably come about in these ten years of thoughtful and friendly effort there still remain a number of steps imperatively to be taken before the teaching of history in secondary schools can without serious qualification be pronounced satisfactory there is still a woeful need of trained history teachers while the larger city high schools and many private schools are praiseworthy exceptions it nevertheless remains true that the majority of schools do not yet think it necessary to choose for the historical department a teacher specially trained for that work the subject is still too often assigned to this teacher or that who happens to have the necessary free time but whose serious equipment lies in some other field nothing short of sound and extended college training in history should be deemed a sufficient preparation for the teaching of history in a secondary school just as nothing short of such training and the frank recognition of its importance by school authorities will overcome the unfortunate reluctance of the best college graduates to enter secondary school work no graduate of brown university can receive from the department of history a certificate of fitness to teach history in a high school or academy who has not completed with credit at least four courses each of three hours a week for a year 
and one of them a course of research and i should be glad did conditions in the schools make it possible to raise as they do make it increasingly easy to enforce this minimum requirement a second crying need is for better equipment of the historical department the development of school libraries has not yet made much progress and the use of public libraries by large classes has obvious practical limitations schools which willingly spend money for scientific apparatus decline to spend money for books pictures and other illustrative material the equipment of wall maps is often exceedingly poor historical maps being often lacking altogether except in the field of ancient history until this lack is supplied we must expect that the teacher will from necessity rely mainly upon the textbook at the cost of failing to meet the most fundamental condition of the newer methods of history teaching perhaps the most serious charge that is lodged against the new method is that it fails to give the pupil exact knowledge and even discriminates against exactness and precision my observation as an examiner of applicants for admission to college leads me to believe that there is force in this charge undoubtedly the amount of ground which is expected to be covered by those who take any one of the four fields recommended by the committee of seven is very great in the field of medieval and modern european history quite too great where the time allotted to the course in the curriculum is insufficient as it often is or where the teacher is incompetent or where the facilities of the department are inadequate it is inevitable that the work should be slighted and the results upon examination appear unsatisfactory undoubtedly also in our zeal for the broad view and the vivifying treatment we have tended unconsciously to depreciate the value of exact knowledge and have allowed ourselves to think that because the function of memorizing may easily be overworked the memory has no place in the study of history at all the examiners in history for the college entrance examination board have learned that unless they asked for dates no dates will be given that the treatment of specific questions of limited scope is prevailingly slovenly indicative of loose thinking and tolerated looseness of expression and that the simplest questions will often be carelessly misread i am sure that we have not yet solved the problem of examining in history either in school or in college but i am also compelled to think that the greatest weakness of history teaching at present in those schools in which the new program is being applied is that it so often fails to give the pupil a definite knowledge of anything i do not despair however there are signs of improvement growing in number and significance every year and with the increased employment of skilled teachers the provision of better facilities for teaching and the more generous recognition of the importance of the subject we may i think confidently look for results commensurate with those admittedly attained in other branches of the school curriculum End of section 1section two of the history teachers magazine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by marianne spiegel the history teachers magazine volume one number two october nineteen o nine section two training the history teacher in the organization of his field of study by norman mclaren trenholm Professor of the Teaching of History, School of Education, University of Missouri. Provided that the textbooks have been selected and the courses to be given arranged for by some higher power, the first problem that faces the history teacher in the fall is that of properly organizing the field or fields of study. Now we all know that many teachers do not realize this problem, or that if they do, they shirk it and adopt a sort of go-as-you-please plan of so many pages each day, irrespective of topical or any other sort of unity that usually results in careless recitation work and an incomplete course in some cases the teacher seeks aid and guidance from a printed syllabus or outline of the course to be covered and if these are available and properly constructed in connection with the textbooks used they can be of great service but they cannot wholly relieve the teacher of responsibility as to the length and character of topics to be considered 
even the best teachers are inclined to adopt a day-to-day -day plan of organization and so work blindly not knowing how much of the textbook will in the end be left unstudied such unsatisfactory conditions as are here referred to are totally unnecessary if history teachers will only learn to organize their courses in advance of giving them and thus be able to round out their work in a thoroughly satisfactory manner the reason that this is not done is that most of our high school teachers of history have little or no training in the teaching of their subject and have not learned how to handle and interpret the subject matter to the best advantage what some lack in training they make up for in enthusiasm and interest in their work but there are, unfortunately for the profession, many teachers of history who have neither training nor enthusiasm. On the other hand, the number of trained, earnest, and enthusiastic teachers of history is constantly increasing, and there are opportunities offered for every teacher to improve his or her methods and enter more understandingly and more successfully into the work of teaching the subject. The greatest danger in history work in schools is the prevalence of matter over spirit, of facts over thoughts and ideas, of mechanical memory work over constructive thinking and reasoning. If teachers of history will learn to enter into their work with more spirit and understanding, the subject will soon be regarded with respect on account of the vital interest that the development of the present out of the past must always have. One way of emphasizing historical unity or continuity is by a well-planned series of recitation or discussion topics based on the textbook used in the course and it is the question of such organization of the field of study that I wish to discuss in this article. General Suggestions as to the Organization The history teacher who wishes to make a success of the courses given must plan the work in advance according to certain common-sense rules and conditions. In the first place, the extent of the subject matter to be covered must be carefully considered in connection with the time allotted for its completion and the relative emphasis to be placed on the different portions of the period to be covered. Instead of a haphazard assignment of so many pages each day, irrespective of time and subject matter, the length and character of the lesson assignments should be plotted out in advance, the number of pages of textbook subject matter be accurately ascertained, many textbooks have pages of outlines, review questions, references, and so forth, and compared with the number of recitation hours available, from which it is well to deduct one-third or one-fourth for reviews, a mechanical basis of assignments can be had. But a mechanical basis is not alone sufficient. A topical one is necessary also. This is the most difficult, at the same time the most vital point, of organization, and the part in which most teachers fail on account of poor perspective as to important and unimportant topics, and a failure to realize the inner meaning and significance of the external events with which they are dealing. Fortunately, most history textbooks have been constructed on a skeleton of topics, and even a poorly trained teacher can, with a little care, discover the proper lesson divisions. Some of the newer textbooks go so far, indeed, as to give a series of lesson topics which the teacher can follow. A competent history teacher, however, should not need to depend entirely on the textbook, outline, or syllabus, but should be able to select his or her own topics with judgment and success. A teacher properly trained to interpret the subject matter of the different fields of study, who will take into account the length of time available and the extent of the text to be covered, can successfully plan out any desired course of study from beginning to end. This plan does not need to be absolutely rigid, but it will be a valuable guide for the work of the year or half-year and will lead to a successful completion of the course of study. Instructors in normal schools and in college departments of education can easily train the students in courses on the teaching of history to make such topical outlines based on standard textbooks. It will be time well spent, as the student will afterwards find it active teaching, as one such experience in enlightened planning out of a field of study will lead to competent handling of other fields. Organization of the Ancient History Field if we say that this field of study should deal with the political, governmental, social, and cultural development of the western portion of the ancient world under the three main divisions of a. the oriental nations, excluding, of course, India, China, and Japan, b. the Greek world, and c. the Roman world, then we have a fairly comprehensive definition of what is to be covered. If we add to this that the chief teaching problem of the course is so to organize and interpret the subject matter as to bring out in a clear and connected way the really significant and essential movements and developments during ancient times in connection with the leading historical peoples, we are giving greater definiteness to the teaching work of the course. 
but what are the really significant and essential movements in the history of the ancient world from the pedagogical viewpoint can it not be said that they are those that have most continuity with and exerted most influence on later mediterranean and european history to this end emphasis should be especially laid on the greek world centering in athens and on rome centering in her great imperial system as a general rule teachers of ancient history are inclined to give too great a proportion of the time at their disposal to the oriental empires and their civilizations to early greek history and archaeology to roman legendary history and to the petty politics and mythical conflicts of the early roman republic and the governmental organization of the decaying republic while athenian life and thought macedonian imperialism and its results the rise and organization of the great roman empire the causes of its strength and of its weakness and decline are not given sufficient time and attention in the general organization of the ancient history field the topic should be so planned that the teacher and class will work from a broad study of the oriental peoples of the eastern mediterranean world and of the early history of the greek peoples and states to a more careful and intensive examination into the athenian world as typical of the best of classic greece of alexander and macedonian imperialism as promoters of hellenic culture the early roman period should be rapidly covered and far less time spent on the republic and its government the object in organizing the roman portion of the ancient history field should be to emphasize the growth of the roman empire and the creation of an imperial system to this end as much attention as possible should be directed to the provinces and to the general problems of the imperial government the influence of the roman historians livy suetonius and even to some extent tactus i refer to the annals and histories and of teachers of the classics is responsible for much wrong perspective in the teaching of ancient history nor have we one really well proportioned textbook for this field though several of the existing ones are fairly satisfactory the success and interest of the ancient history course depends largely on the teacher's power of selection organization and interpretation organization of the field of medieval and modern history in organizing this field of study while following the general rules of organization the teacher should remember that the object of this course is above all else to make the student familiar with his present historical environment and its immediate background to this end it is desirable that a large portion of the time should be devoted to bringing out and emphasizing movements and institutions that have distinctly modern significance and that recent european history should be carefully studied this does not mean however that the medieval portion of the field should be neglected as an important contributory factor in modern civilization emphasis should be laid on the continuity of roman influence as seen in the imperial church and the imperial state and in roman law on the christian religion as a factor in advancing civilization and on the contribution of political social and economic importance made by the germans the medieval world is more foreign to the schoolboy mind than even that of greece and rome and the struggles of popes and emperors the intricacies of feudalism and the aesthetic and adventurous aspects of the crusades are hard for him to understand but the feelings of nationality against imperial control by church or state the growth of the towns and commerce the gradual development of representative government the struggles against despotism these are things that he can understand and appreciate and in connection with which he can see the present emerging from the past nor should the great personalities of medieval and modern history be neglected for they have historical interest and importance and serve to give greater interest and definiteness to movements of which they are a part a little thought and care on the part of the teacher in planning the lesson assignments and conducting the recitation will keep the course from becoming dull and meaningless the attention of the class should always be drawn to the bearing of what they are studying on present conditions and particular emphasis should be directed to great international movements as well as to the growth and development of the leading european countries in no field of high school study does careful previous organization lead to more satisfactory results than in the medieval and modern field organization of the english history field the organization and treatment of this field should be based on the idea of bringing out clearly the origin growth and larger developments of english political social and economic institutions the field offers especial advantages for developmental study as the history is well connected throughout and can be easily organized into topics and problems all that the teacher needs is a little insight into the fundamental factors and influences in english history and this should be obtained from any well-conducted general course in english history 
the history of england should always be organized and treated as being the study of the growth of a great imperial nation out of various elements and through different policies the idea of the growth of free representative government the power of the people or democracy in government is the predominant note but the broader viewpoint of the growth of national civilization as shown in policies industry art language and letters is also desirable and important among the dangers to be avoided in teaching english history and in teaching how to organize it is the temptation to emphasize the minor political details relating to royalties wars and so forth the history of england is after all closely related to the history of europe and the two great questions of interest in her story are those of her internal development along national lines and of her external policy and growth along imperial lines more attention than is now given could well be bestowed on the british empire and it is a pleasure to find one textbook at least that attempts to do justice to this important phase of english history and government organization of the field of american history and government probably all teachers of american history will admit that broadly stated the course in american history and government should be organized with special emphasis on the national period and should represent an attempt to show how out of the diversity of the colonial period there finally emerged the spirit of federal union and how american history largely centers around the erection of a sovereign federal state in face of english opposition and the maintenance of the union in face of internal dissensions and finally the growth and expansion of the united states as a world power the european background the native or american background exploration colonization and colonial development must all be touched on lightly then a careful study should be made of the steps leading up to union and to independence though the military side of the revolutionary struggle is frequently overemphasized and the beginnings of national government as we know it today can be studied in connection with the formation of the constitution territorial expansion foreign and civil wars colonial expansion and problems of internal development can all be treated in relation with the central problem of successful federal government and in relation with the present interwoven frequently with american national history is the history of one's own state and teachers can frequently use local interests to make the story of some particular phase of national development more real and significant there is a quite marked tendency to separate american government from american history in the fourth year of the high school and to give a half year's work on each subject if american government is taught as a separate subject a textbook should be selected which allows the teacher to organize the course so as to work from the familiar to the unfamiliar aspects of government from the local to the national aspects of the field of study several good textbooks of this character have been recently published the attempt has been made in this article to show how the history teacher can be trained or can train himself to organize thoroughly the field of study to be covered so as to complete the course in the time allotted and also to bring out the meaning and importance of the study undertaken proper organization of the field of study will undoubtedly aid the teacher greatly but such organization must be followed by successful recitation and classroom work the next paper in this department will therefore be devoted to a discussion of the training of history teachers in the organization of recitation end of section two Section 3 of The History Teacher's Magazine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The History Teacher's Magazine. Volume 1, Number 2, October, 1909, Section 3, Instruction in American Government in Secondary Schools, A Comment on the Report of the Committee of Five, by William A. Shapes, Chairman of the Committee of Five, Professor of Political Science, University of Minnesota, Minneapolis. The American Political Science Association has taken an interest not only in the investigation and discussion of the scientific questions arising within the field of political science, but has also paid attention to the problem of improving the instruction in government in our schools and colleges. To further this work, a section on instruction in political science 
was organized at its first annual meeting. In 1906, the Committee of Five, originally of three members, was appointed to complete certain investigations which had been started in the section on instruction, the partial results of which had been published in a paper by the writer in the proceedings for 1905. The committee was required to ascertain the amount and kind of instruction in American government being offered in the secondary schools of this country, and make recommendations for the consideration of the association. In accordance with these instructions, the committee undertook to collect its information directly by correspondence with the teachers in about 600 high schools distributed throughout the United States. The work extended over more than two years, the final report being read at the Richmond meeting in December 1908 and published in the proceedings for that year. The point in which the report lays greatest stress, namely, the necessity of teaching government as a distinct subject in the secondary schools, was expressly approved by the association without a dissenting vote. It does not follow, of course, that the report expresses the views of every member of that association in every particular. In fact, it does not. The report does represent the views of the entire committee after making an exhaustive study of the question. The report covers 38 pages of the proceedings, and is therefore too elaborate to be properly presented in a brief article. Only a few of the essential features will be referred to. At the very outset, the committee was confronted with the pedagogical question as to whether government should be taught as a distinct subject, or whether it should be taught in connection with history. The teachers are still somewhat divided on the subject, and practice varies. The information collected indicates that the teaching of American government, civil government or civics, as it is still barbarously designated, is suffering from a lack of proper recognition in the school curriculum, for want of especially trained teachers, from lack of a working school library on government, and from inadequate textbooks. It seems a curious thing that our public schools, which were instituted and are operated by governmental agency to maintain an enlightened citizenship, have taught every other subject except in government. There can be little doubt that the rather confused and contradictory recommendations of the Committee of Seven ten years ago helped materially to spread the impression among high school teachers that the subject of government could not be successfully studied apart from history, and that it is a sort of poor relation to it on which little time need be spent. The suggestion of the Committee of Seven that the subject might be taught in connection with American history was adopted by a large number of schools. The results obtained are generally considered to be unsatisfactory. In the West, out of 240 schools heard from, 153 were offering separate instruction in government, 47 taught the subject in connection with history, and 40 failed to specify the plan in use. The teachers or principals in these schools personally preferred the separate course by 158 to 30, 54 failing to commit themselves. In the South, 85 schools reported a separate course in government, 53 a combination course with history. The teachers or principals reporting preferred the separate course by 111 to 33. In the East and Midwest, 98 schools reported a separate course on government, and 74 a combination course. The teachers or principals expressed in personal preference for the separate course by 110 to 42. It should be noted that the committee divided the states into three more or less arbitrary sections. The West, embracing all the states west of the Mississippi, excepting Missouri and the states to the south. The South including all the states south of the Ohio River and Mason-Dixon's line, and east of the Mississippi, but including Missouri, and the states to the south, 
the east and midwest including the states east of the mississippi and north of the ohio river line the reports from all the sections show that experience is demonstrating that the plan of teaching american government and american history as one subject is bad pedagogy and false economy the fact that the teachers personally prefer the separate course in government by a large majority in all three sections is significant it means that experience is a little ahead of practice and that when practice has caught up with the best experience the combination course will be relegated to the scrap heap of discarded methods in its recommendations the committee urges the need of more and better instruction in government throughout the entire school system from the fifth grade up there can be no question that improvements in the administration of the government have not kept pace with the advances for example in industry in commerce in transportation or even in pure science it is a well-known fact that foreigners find much to learn from this country in the organization of industry and in the methods of conducting business but they do not find so much to commend in the administration of our governments yet it is in this very field of politics and government that this country was long supposed to have completely outstripped all the older countries in the framing of constitutions and in the inauguration of new systems of popularizing political institutions america has led and contributed much but in the careful efficient management of public affairs we have not been so successful in the management of our cities it is conceded that our mistakes and failures are rather more conspicuous than our successes the question naturally arises whether the public schools have not contributed to these mistakes and failures by neglecting to provide adequate instruction in matters of government it may be difficult to demonstrate that school training in the science of government does result in purer political methods and more efficient administration of public business but surely a citizenship whose political information has been gleaned from election posters stump speeches newspaper headlines and highly colored magazine articles will not furnish a model of civic enlightenment and success the duty of fitting the youth for the services and responsibilities of citizenship in the republic under the complex conditions which now prevail belongs primarily to the public school it does not discharge its highest function until it provides for every child adequate instruction in the government of this country so far the public school has failed to do this there are large cities in this country in which no systematic instruction in government is given in the otherwise splendidly equipped high schools nor is the subject taught in the grades some of these cities are in the boss ridden class the question naturally presents itself to our minds is one circumstance the cause of the other certainly a high school situated in a large city that does not lead its boys to study the complex organization and functions of the community in which they live fails in performing its first and highest duty the committee of five therefore recommends that the instruction in government begin with the fifth grade in the fifth sixth and seventh grades subjects should be presented in general school exercises and the subjects selected for language lessons in connection with geography and other exercises in these grades the method of instruction must be largely oral without a text such subjects as the fire department the police the waterworks the parks garbage collection the health officer the light housekeeper the life-saving stations suggest subjects for discussion the aim being to lead the child to think of the community and realize that it has rights obligations property that it does certain kinds of work and that every individual citizen has a part to play in the life and activities of this community in the eighth grade more formal instruction on local state and national government may be given a simple text should be selected and this should be supplemented the main emphasis must be placed on the study of local government to make the subject concrete and bring it home the committee recommends that in the high school government be presented 
as a distinct subject of instruction following one semester of american history at least one half year should be devoted to the subject with five recitations per week or an entire year where the three recitation plan is in use some high schools are indeed devoting an entire year to american government with excellent results in fact if the instruction in all the high schools could be brought up to the level of a few conspicuously advanced schools the main desires of the committee would be fulfilled in selecting a text the teacher should avoid the old style manual consisting of the clauses of the constitution with comments such books are entirely out of date they represent the first attempts at textbook making in this field they never were good texts it is rather surprising that more than a score of high schools reporting still use these useless books the teacher should equally avoid the new hybrid text which attempts to combine in one a treatment of history and government in the very nature of things such books must be confusing and distracting to the beginner it is equally important that the superintendents and principals stop the practice of assigning the subject to any teacher on the force whose time is not fully taken up with other duties no one can hope to teach government with the best success who has not a genuine interest and an appropriate training for the work End of section three. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section four of the History Teachers Magazine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The History Teacher's Magazine, Volume 1, Number 2, October 1909. Section 4. Lessons Drawn from the Papers of History, Examination, Candidates of the College Entrance Examination Board by Elizabeth Briggs, Teacher of History and Civil Government in Sachs School for Girls, New York. In studying the reports of the Secretary of the College Entrance Examination Board, the history teacher learns the disheartening fact that less than 60% of the candidates in history get 60% or over in the examinations the proportion of the whole number of candidates in history who have received over sixty per cent for the past eight years is as follows nineteen o two fifty nine point two per cent nineteen o three fifty three point two per cent nineteen o four fifty three point seven per cent nineteen o five fifty four per cent nineteen o six forty seven point three per cent nineteen o seven forty three point two per cent nineteen o eight fifty point three per cent nineteen o nine forty two point eight per cent footnote these figures are not final as the secretary's report is not out for nineteen o nine end of footnote it should be noted in passing that the lessening number of successful candidates characterizes not only history but the whole group of entrance examination subjects but further disquieting statistics prove that history is generally fewer successful candidates than most of the other subjects in nineteen o seven it was surpassed in this respect only by physics in nineteen o eight by german mathematics and zoology also in the class of high ratings ninety to a hundred history comes near the foot of the class in nineteen o seven all the other subjects ranked higher except physics and chemistry in nineteen o eight all except spanish chemistry botany geography and music that is to say history makes a poorer showing than all the other large subjects 
those offering a thousand candidates or more granting that the demands of the examiners are reasonable history teachers must conclude that the necessary equipment is not being furnished to their pupils although the questions are designed to test something more than a superficial knowledge of events such a superficial knowledge provided it be complete as to the whole field would enable a candidate to obtain a rating of sixty the papers of the candidates are evidence that instruction has been generally omitted on one point and has been slighted on three others in all conferences of history teachers much time is spent in considering how best to inculcate historical mindedness accurate thought cultivation of the imagination and clear reasoning primarily it is acknowledged that there must be acquired a stock of definite information in, but the discussion seem to assume that the acquisition of the information is an easy matter and that the exercise of observation analysis and judgment may occupy the greater part of the time of pupil and teacher in the classroom however both teacher and pupil while trying to respond to the multiplicity of demands have been unable to divide the time into enough fractions to go round and the teachers seem to have reached a consensus that the topic to be crowded out shall be geography in spite of the fact that the requirements in history state that geographical knowledge will be tested by requiring the location of places and movements on an outline map in spite of the fact that almost every set of questions for nine years has demanded map work the papers of candidates have shown that instruction in geography including the use of maps has been signally neglected year after year answers in this subject have been marked uniformly low seldom attaining a passing mark being rated one two and three on a scale of ten and answers to questions which ask that philadelphia constantinople alexandria delos and delphi be marked on the map and their historical importance be explained in the answer book philadelphia was placed in north dakota constantinople in india alexandria on the adriatic delphi in italy and delos near genoa and yet the answer books told correctly the historical importance of each how completely geography may be divorced from map work was illustrated in a few answers to a question that asked for the marking on the map of the english frontier on the european continent in the time of william the first henry the second and henry the fifth several candidates wrote out their answers in addition to indicating them on the map with the curious result of a correct list and an incorrect map that is to say the memorizing of french provinces have been carefully done but there had been no practice in map work a more vicious example of unintelligent memorizing it would be hard to find countries as well as cities have been misplaced ireland and norway wales and germany china and egypt that the ignorance here is due to the teachers and not to the pupils is made apparent by the failure on this point in otherwise excellent papers there could have been no instruction where the intelligent pupil would have met the requirement another proof besides the mass of incorrect answers that map work is neglected in the schools is the fact that when the options permitted a choice between map work and an explanation of geographic control the choice fell on geographic control this choice was made not because the candidate was qualified to write about the effect of geographical conditions on the history of the early settlements in america or on the revolutionary struggle but because guessing seemed easy as for the other quote, eye of history end quote, chronology there is a respectable showing the examination questions have not asked for lists of dates though a knowledge of dates has been frequently demanded by the nature of the questions and such demands have not found the pupils wanting an occasional anachronism has occurred and has served to enliven the reading as the statements that the barons of the time of william the conqueror spent most of their time smoking and drinking and that milton was effective by means of his efforts in the daily papers occasionally a candidate would show what he could do 
by prefacing or concluding his answer book with a chronological table for the whole subject answers to what may be called sweeping questions such as quote, trace the rise and fall of the naval power of athens end quote, show a lack of practice in reviewing by topics though meagre they suggest more acquaintance with the subject than is written down giving evidence of considerable drill on isolated points if not on a continuous story all the history papers since nineteen o one have had questions of this sort and it would seem likely that teachers would take the hint and exercise their pupils in following a train of events from reign to reign from administration to administration from century to century the general failure of this type of question and the general success in timing isolated events leads to the fear that the history is studied wholly by reigns or administrations without regard to the quote, ceaseless course end quote, of time the history examiners have also made a point of introducing questions characterized by their timeliness about alfred the great in the year when the thousandth anniversary of his death was being celebrated in nineteen o four on the louisiana purchase in nineteen o nine on grover cleveland questions which it was expected would receive unusually full treatment the expectation was disappointed possibly because their quote, timeliness end quote, did not exist for the candidate because current events have had no share of his attention though they might be taken in the form of celebration of the past as for current events pure and simple those that belong to the present per se any option on them is avoided the only subject of current interest on which information has seemed to be widespread was the melodramatic experience of miss ellen stone allied to this ignorance of current events is the ignorance of the nineteenth century in modern history and in english history a candidate could write a passable account of charlemagne and fail on bismarck could be accurate about wolsey and yet state that gladstone wrote standard law books for this knowledge of the remote past and ignorance of the recent past dr james sullivan says that the textbooks should be held responsible as few teachers are any better than their textbooks in biography whenever the options made it possible to write on several persons rather than on one the greater majority of the candidates found it easier to present a few meagre facts about several individuals than an extended account of one individual evidently biography in school is confined to the footnotes or the descriptive introductory paragraph on the page that mentions a new leader for the first time in fact one student apologized for his limited knowledge of pitt and nelson on the ground that montgomery gives no extended biographies like dr sullivan he blamed the textbook it should not be implied that the reader finds no evidence of collateral reading indications of it do appear but they are rarer than oasis in sahara far from hinting at collateral reading many answers showed inadequate attention to the slender material offered in the textbook it seems not unreasonable to expect that every student going up for examination in english history should be able to place milton and nelson correctly yet their names have brought out such statements as there is nothing recorded in history showing any personal service that milton did for the roundheads and that personally he was a tory that milton wrote books of travel and wild and probable adventures of sea and land that nelson explored for england and went furthest north that he sunk the spanish armada that he defeated the combined french and spanish navies at waterloo and that he signalled don't give up the ship end quote. the only satisfactory item to be credited to these statements is the fixed association of these names respectively with literature and the sea any hint as to the personality of the subject is seldom found yet william the conqueror henry the eighth and cromwell seem to have had some hold on the imagination to summarize experiences as a reader is not a happy task for the secondary school teacher as regards what may be termed the new learning in history geographic control economics and the exercise of observation analysis and judgment the teacher need not blush at his failure to render his pupil able to observe analyze and judge in clear and correct english 
in fifteen-minute sections of a two-hour examination, or to deal successfully, even in an elementary way, with subjects that have either only recently become part of a college course, or are not generally studied by freshmen. But what history teachers do need to concern themselves with is the failure to supply their pupils with a reliable store of facts. If the statistics of the board seem to imply that history teaching is inferior to teaching in most other subjects, it would be consoling to accept the suggestion that the poor returns are not the result of poor teaching, but of no teaching, since many candidates have tried the examination without instruction, an experiment they would make in no other subject. End of Section 4 Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 5 of the History Teachers Magazine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History Teachers Magazine, Volume 1. Number 2. October, 1909. Section 5. The Study of Western History in Our Schools. By Professor Clarence W. Alvord of the University of Illinois. The West has always been self-assertive. This may sound somewhat banal, but no adjective describes so exactly that principal characteristic of her vigorous youth commercially, politically, socially, she has displayed her egoism and has continually demanded from her elder sister, the East, praise for her achievements. Youth is, however, passing away. Over a century of political life has been left behind. Age has brought with it a new pride in the consciousness of accomplishment. Today, the West realizes that she has had a history that is no mean part of the national story. The cry from the prairies is no longer, see what we are doing, but see what we have done. Self-assertion again, yes, perhaps bumptious, but such is a fact. On every side there are signs of this new phase of Western self-consciousness. In no part of the Union is there such an interest in local history. State-supported departments of history, state historical societies, county and city historical societies, even women's clubs and public schools, and larger unions such as the Confederation of the Societies of the Ohio Valley and the Mississippi Valley Historical Association are all active in collecting material for and exploiting Western history. Some of the efforts are misdirected. Many of the papers presented before these learned societies are absurd. But even the aimless gropings of the historical amoebae indicate the innermost yearnings for a knowledge of the past and the consciousness of deeds worth recording. In developing this consciousness of her past, the West, naturally enough, has found a grievance against the historians of America who have somewhat neglected this important phase of the national development. Before the eyes of the historian, educated under the shadow of the gilded dome of the Puritan capital, the landing of the Pilgrim Fathers looms larger on the historical horizon than the occupation of the old Northwest during the Revolutionary War, so that he gives a more careful and extensive description to the former than to the latter event. The Westerner gazes upon another horizon, where the relative importance of events are differently grouped. To him, many events confined to New England, the description of which fills pages of our national histories, appear of local interest and events belonging to other parts of the country assume national importance. This grievance is not altogether fictitious, as a glance at any of our large histories, and particularly at the textbooks, 
used in our schools will disclose the signs of the times however point to a healthful change for in the last many volumed american history chapter after chapter is devoted to the history of the west the correction of the error in proportion moreover lies in the hands of the western historians who can bring to prominence the events of their section only by producing serious and scientific studies on the development of the west and consciously or unconsciously the recent movement in the study of western history is directed toward that end besides the popular interest in the subject already noted the universities are turning the attention of their graduate students to the field the scientifically trained instructors of these institutions are conducting researches into the history of the valley in other words western history is already recognized as a legitimate field for research work time alone is needed for the results of this activity to become a part of the national consciousness when the relative importance of western events will be correctly given in our larger histories and be finally disseminated through textbooks and popular works to the public the teacher's duty the development of a popular knowledge of the history of the west will largely be the work of the teachers in our public schools this is fortunate for the subject is suited in a remarkable degree for the purposes of instruction in the great central valley the romantic religious political and economic groves have been luxuriant and every student whatever his character will find events to arouse his historical imagination the glamour around the wild life of the forest and prairie appears most brilliant to children the lurking indian the silent jesuit the song-loving voyager the hardy trapper these are figures that give a picturesque touch to our early history which never fails to retain the attention of the class fortunately the earliest phase of western history inspired the brilliant pen of francis parkman and his accounts of the discovery and occupation of the mississippi valley have become parts of the common knowledge of our people so that the figures of marquette la salle and frontenac stand out relatively clear in the memories of the school days since in parkman's works literature romance and good historical narrative are so well combined the teacher should make the most of these for where he ends there is no work or set of works comparable to his to continue the narrative many have been the attempts to tell the story of the advance of the english pioneers across the mountains but we still await the well-equipped and inspired historian there are of course books to which the pupils can turn with profit and interest particularly has the frontiersman with gun and axe been glorified and his picturesque figure is fully as attractive as jesuit priest or french voyager but the fundamental motives of the westward movement should not be lost in the romantic story of a boom or surveyor the first impulse westward came from the englishman's desire to participate in the fur trade which the french threatened to monopolize during the reign of charles the second the movement extending from hudson bay to the carolinas was started almost as early as la salle virginians were on the waters of the upper ohio and were trading among the indians of the southwest the fight for the fur trade had begun land speculation was a second impulse for the westward movement boom towns were not an invention of yesterday the far-famed american pioneer played his part in these enterprises but he was often only a pawn in the hands of the gentleman speculator of the east who is to be found in every period of western development the speculative energy of such men as george washington the lees and george morgan advertised the advantages of the valley lands far and wide 
then followed the wild rush of home-seekers which rapidly built the western states the story of the west in the revolutionary war is not well told in the usual textbooks of the schools for the description of the events which decided whether this vast territory should be british or spanish or belong to the united states are generally relegated to a few lines of a paragraph the settlement of kentucky and tennessee the occupation of the old northwest by the virginians the successful campaigns of governor galvez which gave the floridas to spain the defeat of the various british campaigns to recover their hold on the central mississippi these are all events of stupendous importance for the future development of the american people western tendencies the first and most marked characteristic in the history of the west is its unity this sets it off from the east where particularistic development was the rule on the seaboard well-marked peculiarities separate the inhabitants of the different sections in the mississippi valley state boundaries have little meaning and divide in no way the people living on either side even when broader areas than those of the states are considered diverse development is not so well marked as it is east of the mountains throughout the early pioneer period the emigration westward was the same in character north and south of mason and dixon's line the ohio river was the great channel by which the tide of immigration flowed over the prairies of the old northwest and the blue-grass region of kentucky and accident frequently led one man to the slaveholding states and his neighbor to the north if the ohio was the gateway to the west the mississippi was the great central avenue upon which the western people from all sections met in friendly trade so that the original feeling of solidarity was strengthened by continuous intercourse and the realization of mutual interests the different environment at the headwaters and mouth of the river never succeeded in separating completely the western people here the idea of the unity of the country took deeper root than in the east where statehood meant more and nation less it was in the middle west that as the struggle between north and south drew near national leaders were developed and where the strongest efforts were made to hold the country in unity western democracy the west has molded our national character even more than new england with her far-famed and narrow puritanism for the west has been the cauldron into which the nations of the world have poured their streams of immigrants and from which has come the national type this amalgamation of character began in the oldest west when irishmen englishmen scotch-irish and germans settled in the region between the falls of the seaboard rivers and the mountains stretching from vermont to georgia here was molded the new type of man who was to populate the greater west across the mountain ridges in an environment of primeval conditions in the struggle with the indians and the forests there was developed a self-reliance of character differing in many ways from any single european type this new man of the west admired the doer of deeds condemned all reliance on traditional or family position scorned state authority and loved independence in the soil of the new west created by these men the doctrines of rousseau flourished luxuriantly all unconscious the frontiersmen were putting into practice the most radical philosophy of the french revolution it was on the frontier that those conservative traditions of europe which lingered years afterwards in the more settled east were swept away 
and American democracy was really bred. It was on the border of the old frontier that the spokesman of this democracy, Thomas Jefferson, lived, and it was of the New West that the hero of democracy, Andrew Jackson, came. End of section 5《Section Six of the History Teachers Magazine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The History Teachers Magazine, Volume One, Number Two, October 1909. Section Six: The Newest State Association and an Older One. The California Association of History Teachers by H. W. Edwards of Berkeley. The first meeting of the California Association of History Teachers was held in Berkeley July 14th in connection with the summer session of the University of California. The following papers were read History in the Grammar School, J. B. Newell, University of California. Emphasis in Ancient History, R. F. Schultz, University of California emphasis in teaching history roger b merriman harvard university professor newell urged that in the grades history be taught with more attention to the great fundamental facts and elimination of details he considered that great contests such as the american revolution should be used by the teacher to train the pupil in a broad tolerance by calling attention to the merits of both sides of the question he would have the teachers do more reading for themselves and called attention to the need of more money for providing the schools with books the burden of professor schultz's essay was the neglect of the orient as a constant factor in ancient history many teachers and most textbooks assume that the east ceased to exert a great influence after the time of alexander this tendency to divide ancient history into compartments ignores the solidarity of the ancient world and is essentially unscientific oriental influence was a powerful element throughout the whole of the ancient period in conclusion professor schultz called attention to certain parallels between the race questions of antiquity and those of the present day professor merriman made four principal points one make history interesting better be flippant than dull two compare and correlate example the date fourteen ninety two becomes increasingly significant when one considers lorenzo de medici charles the eighth of france the conquest of granada pope alexander the sixth three relate the past to modern events and conditions four make the development of mental power a constant purpose in addition to these papers two short talks were given professor j n bowman narrated the origin of the Pacific Coast Branch of the American Historical Association, and urged the claims of both parent association and branch. Dr. S. H. Willey, a member of the California Constitutional Convention of 1849, and the first president of the University of California, was present, and was called upon by the chairman. To the history teachers, it was most interesting to listen to one who had done much to make history, and to hear of the birth of the state from one of her fathers. Dr. Willie gave an interesting account of the conditions leading up to the convention, and of the making and adoption of the Constitution, together with references to the great struggle in Congress. He urged that the children of the state be made familiar with the facts of her history, and expressed a hope that the teachers would devote more attention to the subject. The officers of the association are President superintendent e m cox of san rafael secretary professor j n bowman berkeley the history teachers association of maryland by dr eleanor l lord professor of history in women's college baltimore the organization of the maryland association can hardly be described as the result of spontaneous enthusiasm or of voluntary action on the part of the teachers themselves rather it was somewhat in the nature of an experiment in history culture undertaken by request there are reasons partly geographical 
partly economic and partly political it may be why many of the history teachers especially in the rural districts of maryland working a little apart from the main currents of educational progress need an awakening or a lift or both the origin at the annual meeting of the association of history teachers of the middle states and maryland in nineteen o five the difficulty everywhere experienced in reaching teachers who are prevented by duties or by geographical remoteness from attending the conventions was pointed out and it was voted to authorize and encourage the foundation of local conferences of history teachers with a view to minimizing the obstacles to closer contact with the more remote teachers and stimulating interest in local history and in local problems the primary purpose of these local organizations was declared to be the same as that of the main association viz to advance the study and teaching of history and government through discussion a wider discussion than is possible at the annual meeting mr robert h wright of baltimore who was present at the meeting was requested to attempt the formation of a local association for baltimore a few weeks later as the result of a conference of five individuals interested in the matter an invitation was extended to a number of local teachers and students of history to attend a meeting in the donovan room johns hopkins university the very room as it happened in which the association of history teachers of the middle states and maryland was organized this meeting held may nineteenth nineteen o six was well attended the objects of the proposed association were stated and a temporary organization effected it was voted to extend the geographical scope of the association so as to include the state of maryland as well as baltimore city the constitution subsequently adopted stated the purpose of the association to be in addition to the objects already mentioned the promotion of personal acquaintance among teachers and students of history and as far as practicable the furtherance of the interests of the main association progress of the association the maryland association has made fair progress in the three years of its existence the membership numbering at present about thirty-five includes university college normal high and elementary school teachers of history as well as school superintendents and supervisors the activities of the association may be summarized briefly since the date of organization seven regular meetings have been held and the following subjects have been discussed historical aspects of the united states navy by hon charles j bonaparte secretary of the navy fundamental principles in teaching history by professor charles m andrews johns hopkins university the best methods of controlling and testing the students work in history by principal r h wright eastern high school for girls and professor eleanor l lord woman's college of baltimore the correlation of history and geography by miss elizabeth montell teachers training school the correlation of history and english by miss annette hopkins teachers training school essentials in teaching history by supervising principal h m johnson washington d c sources of american history in the british archives by professor c m andrews johns hopkins university public libraries as an aid to students and teachers of history by dr bernard steiner librarian of enoch pratt free library management of collateral reading in connection with the textbook by miss annie graves arundel school and miss florence hoyt bryn mawr school during the winter of nineteen o seven to nineteen o eight a study section for the study of civics was successfully carried on by mr robert h wright the most ambitious work undertaken has been the compilation of an annotated bibliography for the use of history teachers the task was entrusted to professor c m andrews mr j montgomery gambrill and miss lida lee tall the bibliography was published in installments in the atlantic educational journal through the courtesy of the editors and it will shortly appear in permanent form when the association of history teachers of the middle states and maryland met in baltimore in march nineteen o eight the local association acted in a sense as hosts on this occasion a guide to points of historical interest in baltimore 
was compiled for the local association by dr annie h abel and dr eleanor l lord and copies were distributed to the members of the visiting association ideals of the founders in planning the work of the association the executive board had always had in view the fact that not only the general meetings of the main association but even those of the local conference are beyond the reach of many who may feel the need of information about matters that closely concern persons engaged in the teaching of history the stimulus of contact with others teaching the same subject the enrichment of their own minds through a fresh study of the subject in the light of recent scholarship repeated efforts have been made by means of circular letters to elicit suggestions of means of making the association useful to its more remote members and all members have been urged to join individually the association of the middle states and maryland in order that they may receive its publications and those of the new england and north central associations thirteen new members were added to the main association during the year nineteen o eight to nineteen o nine an effort is now being made to improve the library facilities of teachers in the rural districts and the cooperation of the state library commission of maryland has been promised in an effort to circulate through the county high schools traveling book boxes selected according to the classification of the bibliography mentioned above the officers for nineteen o eight to nineteen o nine were as follows president eleanor l lord vice president charles m andrews secretary treasurer robert h wright additional members of the board of governors lida lee tall j montgomery gamble end of section six Section 7 of the History Teachers Magazine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Walters. The History Teachers Magazine, Volume 1, Number 2, October 1909. Section 7 An Ancient History Character Social by Mary North montclair new jersey one hundred and fifty boys and girls in the first year class of a suburban high school planned and carried through a most successful review in ancient history last may the course provides for five periods a week one of which is unprepared and it covers oriental history as well as greek and roman the pupils had exhibited much interest during the year but were beginning to show signs of listlessness and fatigue and something had to be done to arouse their enthusiasm a character social was suggested by the teacher and more was accomplished by it than could have been gained by weeks of urging and toil each division appointed a committee to assist in the preparations and by the time that the affair was over more than half of the pupils had taken an active part in the arrangements besides committees on program printing refreshments and decorating there were special groups at work Several boys busied themselves making siege machinery, such as the Romans used, while some of the girls dressed small dolls to represent Roman soldiers. All of the models were exact, and required much study and skill on the part of the makers. The much-talked-about theory of coordination was put into practice, for the Latin department provided accounts and pictures of sieges, while the manual training teachers allowed the boys the use of the shop. Another set of pupils planned an exhibition of statuary, preparing garments and studying poses of famous classic statues. The first number on the program was the exhibition of the siege machinery. On the platform were a city wall and tower built of wooden blocks, and before them, arranged for the attack, were many pieces of machinery. The boys who made the machines had charge of the siege, and each exhibited his instrument, giving its name and explaining its mechanism. There were catapults, ballistae, battering rams, Vinii, Plutei, tray buckets, wall hooks, and besieging towers. The chairman of the committee explained the grouping of the machines on the field and the relative importance of the various instruments, and then the siege began. Each machine actually worked, and the city wall collapsed. On a table nearby, the legates, slingers, and centurions witnessed the siege, but took no active part. 
they were very properly clad but their flaxen locks and gentle eyes belied their warlike apparel another part of the platform had been arranged for the exhibition of statuary and was fronted by a large picture frame illuminated by electricity when the curtain was first drawn there stood in the frame the famous morning athena recently found in the ruins of the parthenon the gracchi next appeared and were followed by a vestal virgin who gave place to two lictors the last statue was minerva Gristiniani, perhaps the most successful of all it had taken the combined efforts of many pupils to produce helmet serpent and spear so that all were vitally interested in this statue her pose and expression were perfect and the silence which greeted her was intense until broken by deafening applause the early numbers on the program were most interesting but did not compare with the character social itself each person on arriving had been tagged with a number and had communicated to a trusty official the name of the character that he had chosen these characters could be taken from the oriental monarchies as well as from greece and rome they must however have been mentioned in the textbooks myers and maury each player was provided with a pencil and printed program containing a list of numbers corresponding to those of the characters present at a given signal the game began and each assumed his character no one told his name but each talked or acted as if he were caesar or alexander or Ramses. as soon as a boy discovered that he was talking to caesar he would scribble down caesar opposite the proper number and rush off to talk to someone else one boy wore a double-faced mask and carried little gates another had a tiny pair of boots pinned to his coat and carried in his hand a beautiful toy horse a girl carried a lantern and anxiously searched the faces of all her comrades her quest seemed fruitless and she would sadly shake her head and move on every mind was hard at work and at the end of the hour it was with difficulty that the room was brought to order to compare characters with the original list the correct list of characters was read and all who had guessed over seventy were invited to the platform no one responded to the descending numbers called until sixty was reached when one girl came up the others followed in increasing numbers until the faculty began to respond in the thirties the quiet and suspense during this calling off of numbers was most intense of course no one had conversed with each character present but many characters guessed correctly all the characters they had met for days after the social this character study continued because the boys and girls kept going over in their minds the characters they had met and not guessed and kept comparing notes until the list of characters they knew was greatly increased when the real review came in class the pupils discovered that scarcely a period could be found that had not been touched upon while the teacher had again secured an enthusiastic group of students instead of numberless indifferent boys and girls end of section seven recording by april walters at aprilwalters dot com section eight of the history teachers magazine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by annie rue the history teachers magazine volume one number two october nineteen o nine section eight method the need printed on another page of this number is a paper by miss briggs upon her experiences as an examiner and reader in history for the college entrance examination board in which figures are given to show that history papers are rated lower than any other of the major subjects and that the average grade in history instead of rising is actually getting lower year by year miss briggs expresses the hope that the low grades are due to the number of applicants who prepare by rapid tutoring or wholly by themselves for the history examinations a practice of course almost impossible in the other major subjects but while such cramming is partly responsible for the failure of history applicants it cannot relieve the history teacher of blame all who have had experience in the marking of history papers in the entrance examinations know that much of the history of teaching is careless indefinite and without evident purpose or understanding 
if our subject is not to lose caste altogether we must find a method which will give the student that which can be measured objectively as well as furnish subjective satisfaction or culture such a method will not add to the intricacy of history for the student but will require more efficient teachers of the subject and will prevent the serious evil of the high school teaching of history the assignment of history to any unattached instructor whether he or she knows anything about history or no history teaching in the college or the graduate school has to a certain extent found itself and won the respect of its fellows history teaching in the high school and preparatory school has not yet reached that point of self-development there has been much talk and rightfully about the content of secondary school history courses the market has been filled with excellent textbooks and admirable source books indeed they are almost too good in that they have made the textbook recitations easier and somewhat more interesting there have been pages and volumes of reading references and map references and source references yet with all these aids to the better teaching of history there has not gone a proportionate ability to use them let us ask for a while not what period of history shall we teach but how shall we teach any period of history in the latin or greek class there are objective standards which must be reached in the mathematics or the english class there is a certain amount and quality of productive work to be accomplished in the physics or chemistry or botany class there is laboratory experience to be gained and recorded in notebooks has history a method which can be compared with any of these can we measure objectively the student's acquisition can we get him to use in some way his experiences in the field of history or have him record them in a valuable form it may be objected that the establishment of a more intricate historical method will add to the duties and labor of the history teacher this may be true and indeed it ought to be true the day ought to have passed when a college graduate who took in college but one course in history and that in oriental history should be thought qualified to teach history in a secondary school such cases are not rare to-day they would be rarer if the historical method were more definite and required better training professor fling's article in the september magazine and professor trenholm's article in this and subsequent numbers will furnish some details of historical method which should be valuable to every history teacher in carrying out these suggestions the teacher may temporarily add to his or her own labors but this will not be for long added efficiency will mean greater respect for the teacher and the subject and increased respect will bring more assistance in history more time devoted to the subject and incidentally a stronger demand for good history teachers economically as well as intellectually the history teacher will profit by raising the standards of his profession end of section eight Section 9 of The History Teacher's Magazine. This is a LibriVox recording. Our LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History Teacher's Magazine, Volume 1, Number 2, October 1909. Section 9 European History in the Secondary School by d c knowlton p h d editor the struggle between the church and the medieval empire the importance of the church the problem of simplifying and of unifying the material for study so as to give the student a clear conception of the course of european development is one that confronts the teacher at every turn and calls constantly for solution in this connection, Professor Emerton, in his address on the teaching of medieval history in the schools, points out the importance of the study of the Church as the great unifying element in European progress, especially throughout the Middle Ages. All the people of Europe, divided as they are by nationalities and by social classes, are all united in this one common possession of religion and a culture derived from rome 
and holding them still after generations of separation in an ideal attachment to something they feel to be higher and better than anything in the present world the aims of the papacy in particular says professor emerton makes this task of the teacher easier of solution because the successors of st peter even harking back to the times of gregory i strove one and all for the same end to enforce anew this ideal of a vast christian state governed in the last resort by an appeal to its own divinely constituted tribunal the greatest efforts put forth to this end fall within the period under consideration namely from the times of hildebrand to the death of frederick the second or more exactly from about ten fifty when hildebrand was fast becoming the power behind the papal throne to twelve sixty eight when conradin's untimely death in the market-place of naples terminated the rule of the hohenstaufen the presentation of the relations between the popes and the emperors of this period involves a fourfold task namely an appreciation one of the time covered and the areas concerned two the personalities involved three the issues at stake and four the effects of the struggle on europe the elements of time and place it may be an elementary consideration but it is withal fundamental that the pupil grasp the length of time involved the order in which the events occurred and the theatre on which they transpired it is not a continuous struggle for it is opened then closed then reopened again now by pope now by emperor on the other hand the successive meetings of popes and emperors in conflict are but phases of one and the same great struggle for supremacy whose issue professor emerton has so clearly stated these phases must be clearly defined as to their time limits if the student is to follow the contest intelligently as to the countries or localities involved he must understand what was meant by the holy roman empire of the german people and what its limits were both actual and theoretical to which he must add a more detailed knowledge of italy particularly of lombardy and the new norman kingdom in the south which proved to be such an important factor in the situation the personalities in the struggle in no period of the middle ages can we find personalities more striking than those zealous upholders of the papal prerogative gregory the seventh and innocent the third a statement which applies equally well to the great champions of the empire frederick the first and frederick the second frederick barbarossa attained his exalted position when scarcely thirty his illustrious namesake at an even earlier age both therefore entered the contest with all the vigour and enthusiasm of a young manhood although gregory the seventh and innocent the third were somewhat far far advanced in life they too had lost none of their youthful ardour and enthusiasm as they had risen rapidly to high position the one becoming papal counsellor before he was thirty the other elected pope at thirty-eight these men represent some of the best products of the times in character physique scholarly attainments and native ability frederick the second even foreshadows in character rulers like henry the eighth and louis the eleventh who lived more than two centuries later alike in some respects what contrasts they present in others so faithfully have the chroniclers performed their tasks that it is comparatively easy to call them up and make them pass in review before us hildebrand unimposing in appearance but passionate and indomitable henry the fourth intelligent but violent the tall fair-haired princely barbarossa the thin but well-proportioned frederick the second of studious mien and finally the majestic innocent the third now giving way to bursts of anger and now plunged into fits of deep melancholy the principles which these men represented could not have had better advocates the issues 
an examination of the three main struggles shows that each of these champions of church and state hoped to realize a definite aim which he usually sought to attain in his own way it is most interesting to follow the ebb and flow of the tide of battle the pope was the first to throw down the gauge of battle by attempting to remove the church from politics through the suppression of simony and the marriage of the clergy the very boldness of gregory in daring to alter conditions which had not been disturbed for generations and that too in the face of the strongest opposition calls forth not only surprise but admiration which increases as we examine the forces upon which he relied to accomplish his results namely the canon law the church organization and the ban of excommunication according to some authorities the very year which witnessed the settlement of the first great struggle eleven twenty two marked the birth of frederick i the second great champion of the rights of the empire rightly named the imperialist hildebrand selecting charlemagne as his model he strove not only to unify his german possessions but to re-establish the power and authority of the empire in europe by reasserting its right to rule rome and the lombard cities and by endeavouring to unite with it the norman possessions in the south of italy these attempts naturally brought him into conflict with the papacy which feared so dangerous a neighbour on its very borders his main reliance was in the recently revived study of the roman law and in his labours he governed himself by the maxim that all that pleases a prince has the force of law innocent the third with perhaps the highest conception of his position of any individual who had thus far occupied the chair of st peter dared to assert that the lord gave that apostle the rule not only of the universal church but also the rule of the whole world that these were not mere phrases on his lips was shown by his efforts to extend his authority to the furthest bounds of christendom favoured somewhat by circumstances he became for a time the arbiter of the destinies of the empire but at no time did he have a full man worthy of his steel within its confines these were rather to be found in the limits of christendom in the rising kingdoms of france and england whose sovereigns nevertheless trembled before his threats and repented of their misdeeds like gregory the seventh he asked for no stronger weapons than the terrors inspired by the wrath of mother church finally there appeared in the arena the brilliant ward of this the greatest of popes frederick the second aptly characterized as the first of modern kings striving for absolute mastery in sicily and in germany placing his trust as did his illustrious ancestor in the roman law but utilizing at the same time his knowledge of men and the rising power of the bourgeoisie his plans like those of barbarossa met with rigorous oppositions at the hands of the popes and for much the same reasons effects of the struggle when we pass to our final consideration namely the effects of these struggles on their participants and upon europe we find ourselves face to face with incidents of a most dramatic character the scene at canossa is the most familiar of these but there was also the no less humiliating spectacle later as the portals of st mark's in venice when frederick barbarossa sought a reconciliation with alexander the third followed almost a hundred years later by the tragic end of the last of the hohenstaufen these events dramatic as they appear serve rather to mark the progress of the long struggle than as epitomes of its results these must be sought in the relative position and influence of the church and empire in europe at the end of the period although both reached the apogee of the power and influence during this period the middle of the thirteenth century marks the period of their decline this decay was more marked at first in the case of the empire which practically ceased to exist in name the time however was not far distant when the papacy too 
was to enter the valley of humiliation and drink to the dregs of the bitter cup which it had put to the lips of its great adversary one generation more and the same nation which had sent an army to defend its cause in italy was to strike it in the face with the iron glove of one of its own subjects and was then to capture it and hold it an ignominious tool for political ends during a century more these facts with a more detailed statement of the various symptoms of decay should be impressed upon the student as the teacher brings the period to a close literature the account of the three phases of the struggle as given by grant in his outlines of european history is especially to be recommended for its brevity clearness simplicity and comprehensiveness also chapter ten in adam's civilization during the middle ages which summarizes the struggle from a slightly different standpoint portraits of the main actors are to be found in beaumont and monon's medieval europe from three ninety five to twelve seventy trout empire and papacy and emerton medieval europe eight fourteen till thirteen hundred these books are also valuable for the details of the struggle there is abundant source material in robinson Ogg, and thatcher and mcneil to make clear the attitude of the popes notably of gregory the seventh and the various treatises and compromises which marked the different stages of the struggle in some cases contemporary accounts are given of the struggle itself e g of the scene at canossa in this connection mention might be made of the description of the scene by dr jaeger as an illustration of the narrative method of presentation as employed by the german schoolmaster end of section nine recording by monica m c Section 10 of the History Teachers Magazine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The History Teachers Magazine, Volume 1, Number 2, October 1909. Section 10 English History in the Secondary School. C. B. Newton, Editor roman numeral two the development of the english nation to edward i feudalism one way to get at it it seems to me better not to grapple with feudalism until the rage of the conquest is fairly past and we come to the actual reign of william i partly because we have our hands full before this in trying to instil a reasonably clear idea of the saxon forms of government and partly because it is not very clear just how early feudal forms and customs began to be disseminated throughout england so we may as well merely mention their existence before the norman regime and not explain them fully till we are called on to show what modification in the continental system was made by the conqueror the feudal system is so difficult to define briefly that most textbooks evade the attempt to do so i believe however in introducing even so large a subject as this with a terse definition such for example as feudalism was a method of land ownership and government common throughout europe during the middle ages it does a boy or girl no harm to learn a short statement like this even though it means little to him or her at first it serves as a rallying point for explanation its terms are pegs on which to hang further details in orderly fashion to explain more concretely just what i mean suppose we take the above definition any other would do and see how we may proceed with it in the classroom so as to light it up with real meaning a let us say has recited the definition glibly having taken it down in his notebook the day before with instructions to learn it by heart now a says the astute teacher do you understand what that means not exactly hesitates a if he is ingenuous if he isn't he may easily be confounded good you reply in one stroke 
commending his honesty and showing that you do not expect bricks without straw let's see if we can't get at its meaning does your father own any land a surprised look and pricking up of ears in the class no well he rents your home then yes but somebody owns it of course and how did he get it bought it probably do you know of any way of getting land except by buying or renting it voice from an excited hand across the room how about wills yes land may be inherited but it had to be bought once didn't it well you continue to a and the class this buying or renting for money is our method of land ownership do you see now did you ever hear of a man's being in congress or the legislature or being a judge simply because he owned or rented a certain amount of land certainly not men are elected or appointed to places in our government land ownership and government are separate matters just think how different it was in old england and throughout europe for that matter in feudal times men held high position in the nation largely because of their great estates together with their prowess in war now instead of buying or renting land how would your landlord or your father have got it say in the reign of william the first a from the king or from some big noble right you are but how for nothing no in return for fighting for him yes and on a few other conditions they are given in your book what were they x what asleep forgotten c tell us so you proceed to draw out the details of homage fealty and service the theory of royal ownership the terms suzerain vassal fief etc drilling in the unfamiliar words by frequent use comparing them as far as possible with present terms and usages and bringing out by contrast and comparison the essentials of the whole system finally you show that the system was universal throughout christendom explain what the middle ages were if a c or x can't and point out the adaptability of feudalism to the time when you have finished this your period will have flown lucky if the bell does not ring too soon and your mere definition will mean something to all but your dullest pupils on pages one thirty one to one thirty six of cheney's readings are some excellent practical details of feudal procedure which will be found useful for examples a logical approach to the origins of the jury did you ever stop to think how little your intelligent pupil understands about some present-day institutions the origins of which interest us because we appreciate their modern practice and significance take for example the jury a little questioning will bring out whether or not your class knows the difference between a trial jury and a grand jury either in makeup or in functions unless you are more fortunate than i have been you will find they know very little now does it not seem an illogical absurdity to wade right into the beginnings of the jury system in the days of henry the second when our class has little or no notion of what the system is now or what it stands for when we come to this point therefore in the epoch-making reign of king henry the second it is pertinent and profitable to digress into a clear discussion of the jury of today, bringing out what knowledge we can find in the class and adding to it by such socratic method of question and answer as we may have used in connection with feudalism rather than by giving a talk on the subject after paving the way in this fashion we may start in with the assize of clarendon cheney's readings pages one forty one to one forty two and the distinction between recognitors and presentment so we shall emphasize the essential facts and also bring out the similarity and the difference between the germ and the present fruit of this ancient method of arriving at justice some great personalities i think it is helpful to the memory and useful because of the great influence of the crown throughout english history to bring out the personality of every sovereign so that the names of each dynasty will not be a list of names and nothing more but in every century we shall find certain great personalities either on the throne or off it which should be made as vivid as may be 
to this rule the eleventh and twelfth are no exception there are five men in these centuries which seem to me particularly worth dwelling on william the first and henry the second surely two of the really great kings of england becket and langton types of great churchmen and exemplars of the enormous power of the church and simon de montfort highest type among the early nobility vivid word pictures of the conqueror may be found in freeman's norman conquest volume two pages one hundred six to one thirteen and shorter in green's short history pages seventy four to seventy six henry the second is portrayed by a contemporary cheney's readings pages one thirty seven to one thirty nine and in green pages one o four to one o five becket is described by green page one o six and a good story of his relation to henry the second is told in cheney page one forty four for langton see green pages one twenty six to one twenty seven for simon de montfort see green one fifty two to one fifty three or cheney pages two twenty one to two twenty four further notes and references there is a good brief account of general conditions church and state development of learning town and country life architecture etc pages one sixty five to one seventy one of gardner's students history if one can get the time a reading or re-reading as the case may be of green's short history on the towns pages ninety two to ninety four literature pages one seventeen to one twenty one and the universities pages one thirty two to one forty one is exceedingly refreshing cheney's readings also contain interesting quotations on the universities pages one eighty eight to one ninety five in bringing out the causes of the controversy over the constitutions of clarendon it is appropriate to quote william the conqueror's edict cheney pages one o nine to one ten in support of becket's contention as well as to read from the constitutions themselves cheney pages one forty six to one fifty if one has time for a little touch of humor and human nature in the classroom not strictly important in itself the account of the bishop's speeches before the pope in connection with the quarrel with becket is most amusing cheney pages one fifty one to one fifty four for a very full and interesting account of feudalism see beard's introduction to english historians pages seventy three to ninety six shorter quotations giving some interesting detail have already been referred to cheney pages one thirty one to one thirty six a clear account of the government of england as established under the normans is contained in chapter seventeen of the normans in europe in the epics of history series pages two thirty four to two forty eight the early plantagenets in the same series is concise and useful for sidelights on john's and henry the third's reigns on the magna carta and on the origin of parliament beard's introduction pages one ten to one twenty three and one twenty four to one thirty eight respectively contains a mine of valuable comment in connection with the famous parliament of twelve sixty five the fact that parliament was not really a legislative body at this time should be strongly emphasized for realism i know nothing better than the graphic account in the anglo-saxon chronicle of the evils of stephen's reign cheney pages one twenty eight to one thirty or more briefly green page one o three the only good novel which i know of in this period i should be glad to hear of others is maurice hewlett's richard yea and nay a wonderfully vivid book but hardly suitable to put in the hands of young folk in general end of section ten section eleven of the history teachers magazine this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Rue. The History Teachers Magazine, Volume 1, Number 2, October 1909, Section 11. Robinson and Beard's Development of Modern Europe. Reviewed by Professor Sidney B. Fay of Dartmouth College.
if a teacher finds that the remoteness of pericles and clovis makes it difficult to arouse in history class the most active interest of the student who nevertheless would be keen to know something of bismarck and lee hyung chang or if a teacher finds it unsatisfactory in the second year course in medieval and modern european history to try to teach the spread of constitutional government and democratic ideas from the french to the turkish revolution before the student knows anything of the english parliamentary system and of the industrial revolution or the teacher is assailed by the school board or by the tax-paying parents of the pupils on the ground that ancient and medieval history is relatively useless and ought to be replaced by something more practical such a teacher will find in these two volumes a very present help in a time of trouble the authors have thrown to the winds the recommendations of the committee of seven and do not try to make their book fit into any four years course as now outlined for high schools the first volume begins with the reign of louis fourteenth and from that moment the reader's eye is constantly directed forward to the present moment so that he can read intelligently the dispatches from europe in his morning newspaper much of the traditional matter is omitted in order to give fuller treatment to those subjects which are most important for an understanding of the present this leads to an arrangement and a placing of emphasis which often seems arbitrary and unhistorical as for instance the scant half-dozen pages given to the whole reign of napoleon the third or the insertion in each volume of a score of pages on natural science it is of course desirable to have the pupil have some knowledge of the development and influence of such fundamental subjects as evolution bacteriology and the atomic theory but it is unwise to put these things in a textbook of history few teachers at present could teach these pages properly and efficiency of instruction is likely to be weakened in any institution where instructors trespass on each other's fields this criticism however does not apply to the remarkable chapter on the industrial revolution and to the excellent pages on socialism colonial expansion russo-japanese relations and other timely topics of present-day interest all of these may properly be taught by the teacher of history the authors have made a textbook which is accurate lucid packed with information and at the same time extremely readable it has already been used in some college courses and evokes real enthusiasm from the students they feel they are learning things which are of practical value and are up to date probably this textbook at present at any rate is better adapted for college than for high school use but schools of business or commerce could very profitably use it ordinary high schools should have it in the school library for collateral reading but could not adopt it as a textbook until they are ready to readjust their history curriculum so as to give much more time than the present to modern european history perhaps that time is not far distant citation the development of modern europe by james harvey robinson and charles a beard two volumes boston 1908 ginn and company end of section eleven